John, it's a pleasure pleasure to meet you. Um, I'm Pete Catanio. That is the mighty John Shanley. Um, and it's uh, an honour to talk to you about your film. I don't know if people haven't seen it. It's uh, a beautifully lyrical love story. I hope I describe it right. It's a very lyrical love story about unrequited love and kind of a contemporary fairy tale, really, set in rural Ireland. That's what I took from it. So I suppose the first... First of all, I loved the movie. It was a very charming and uh, moving experience, particularly the use of music. The, the music always does it for me. It always gets right into the heart, you know. But I suppose the first question would be just talk us through the origins of the project. I know it was originally a screenplay. Um, actually, actually. I mean, originally, sorry, originally a stage play. And what yeah. kind of inspired you to take it from stage to screen? Well, I guess the first thing was uh, that uh, my father uh, was an immigrant from Ireland, came here when he was 24. Uh, and when he got older, he asked me, he went every year to visit his family on the farm that he was born on and that is still in my family. And when he got to be a certain age, he asked me to go along with him uh, and drive the car. Uh, so uh, I did so. And I, when I met my Irish branch of the family uh, on their farm, in their kitchen in County Westmead, uh, I immediately felt like a missing piece of the puzzle of my own nature, my own personality uh, fell into place. The, these people were my people and they were incredibly soulful, funny, madcap, uh, anything and everything that you would hope for from an undiscovered relative, these people were times 10. And so I went back several times uh, and spent time with them and my father until he passed and then continued to go after that. Uh, and uh, uh, always knowing that eventually I would have to write about uh, this beautiful, beautiful country and these wonderful people. How amazing. And how much did it change? I'm intrigued to know because the, the film feels very expansive. It feels like the countryside of Ireland, the animals, the whole visceral, the weather, the visceral nature of Ireland is a massive character in the film. The score, it just feels very cinematic. It doesn't feel like one of those films where you think, oh, was this a play? Because um, other than the wonderful dialogue, you know, it just I just wonder how much it changed really from the play to screen. Oh, it changed the, uh, uh, quite a decent amount, you know. There's... I had previously done another play to film, which was Doubt. Uh, and I remember, uh, you know, there's a, there's a bone of contention in that story about this uh, black student that's in the school. And uh, people would ask me, is the black student gonna be in the movie? Are you gonna actually see him? And I'm like, yeah, it's a movie. It's completely bizarre to mention somebody central and not show them in the film. Whereas in a play, for some reason, that kind of artifice is okay. Uh, and so that was a massive challenge to turn into a film uh, because there's basically uh, three out of four characters were dressed head to toe in black. Nobody drove a car, nobody kissed anybody, nobody shot a gun off. How the heck am I gonna keep this interesting for the better part of two hours? With uh, the play, for this, that this one is based on, it was called Outside Mullingar. And uh, I immediately knew when we decided to adapt it into a film that it was going to be easier because it was so difficult not to include Ireland. Ireland is mm -hmm. such a magical and gorgeous place. Uh, and it's difficult not to include the animals. Uh, and uh, not to get, use all of the marvelous tools that you have at your disposal when you're making the film as opposed to making a play. Uh, so uh, at every turn, I found another advantage in turning the play into a film. Uh, and uh, funnily enough, well, you know, one of the things was that County Westmeath, where Mull Mullingar is located, uh, is uh, the Midlands, and it's quite flat. And I thought, I don't want to shoot a whole movie some, in some locale that is predominantly flat because I feel that I am emotionally mountainous 
and that I need that up and downness of mountains uh, to supplant uh, the language and the romance and the pain uh, that these characters contain. And so I uh, thought, well, you know, and I always hated the title that I'd given the play outside <laughs> of I thought it was the most mundane pedestrian title I'd ever come up with. And in fact, people were constantly saying to me that, yeah, that I really enjoyed that play outside. What, what was, was it, it called? Again? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I changed the title to the name of one of my favorite songs, which is Wild Mountain Time. Uh, and also because I wanted to relocate the film to the west of Ireland, uh, where there are more mountains to be found. So I said to the location scouts, I want you to find me the most beautiful farm in Ireland. And I want you to find me the most beautiful mountain. And they came back with that they had found both together. And uh, that's where I ended up shooting the film in uh, outside a little town called Cross Malina uh, and Ballina. Uh, uh, and uh, strangely enough, Ballina is where President Biden hails from. So uh, they're feeling very much at the center of things. Excellent. And were they glad to have you there? Were they? Uh, uh, they hospital, were the most welcoming, talk? accommodating, kind, joyful bunch I've run into in some time. Yeah, wonderful. Maybe just want to go to Ireland, I've got to say. So the cast, for the cast, um, you've got a great cast there with Emily Blunt and Jamie Dornan and John Hamm. It seems like the part was like written for him. Um, but how hard was it to hook them in? Do they come in early? Did you have them in mind when you were writing the screenplay? I never have anybody in mind when I'm writing a, a movie. Uh, I, because basically the people that I have in mind are actual people that I mm. know or that I have some relationship to. Uh, and I write from there, from that uh, genuine experience that I've had of certain people. And then once the script exists, then I turn around and say, okay, now in the firmament of movie stars, who can I cast in this movie that will be a great asset and addition to the telling of the story? And so I started with Jamie Dornan because I was looking for somebody who was kind of dark and brooding and rom a romantic lead it turned out that, Rome, that Jamie Dornan is not only all of those things, but he's Irish. He That's lives right. in Ireland. Uh, mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that kind of makes it a no brainer. Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, to my, uh, we're having, we had uh, a girl cast uh, in the lead opposite him, but she, her schedule changes, she couldn't do it. And they said, well, who do you want to go to next? And I said, kind of over my shoulder as I was walking out the door, well, you can try Emily Blunt. Um, uh, and of course, she'd be great. Uh, but I never thought we'd get her. And then literally, like three days later, she called and said, I want to do it. Uh, and I'm like, oh, oh, OK. Uh, <laughs> She's and... not Irish, is she? She looks very Irish. She does have an <laughs> Irish look. Yeah, well, you know, she's English and oh. she, she's a musician. And so that means she has an excellent ear uh, and uh, could do an uh, Irish brogue uh, very credibly, in addition to being a fabulous actress. Uh, and then uh, I uh, got Chris Walken the next day to play the father. Now, you know, Chris Walken is by no stretch of the imagination Irish. Uh, he's Chris Walken. And actually, when we talked about uh, accents, I said, well, I, I said to the dialogue coach, the acting action accent coach. I said, I never want to go so far that I gain the perfect Irish accent and lose Chris Walken. I want Chris mm. Walken. And so they came up with a kind of, you know, uh, middle Irish accent for Chris, which he brought up very well. Uh, mm. And uh, then uh, there was an American love interest who was an offstage character in the play. But as I explained, when you're doing a film, you bring the offstage characters on, which can be great fun. Uh, and uh, I uh, thought, well, who's the most American and handsome, fine broth of a man that I can think of? And it was John Hamm, who's also just a sensational actor, both technically and in terms of his soul. Uh, and so I brought him into the mix as a, really a, a very dramatic 
uh, difference in choice for Emily between two men. Two men could not be less similar, except for the fact they're both very good looking. Uh, <laughs> and, and so, you know, I wouldn't know who to choose, frankly. Uh, but he just embodied it. John Hamm, just, you couldn't imagine anyone else actually the perfect Mr. Yeah. America walking into that farm, yeah. getting out of the Rolls Royce. Fantastic. And then, and then you know, for the this last uh, bit of the puzzle, which is the woman to play Emily Blunt's mother, uh, I was able to get Dervilla Malloy, who was also an Irish actress and who had created the role when, <clears throat> when we did it on stage in New York, uh, on Broadway, and had been uh, just marvelous and charming in the part. And in fact, when she came to the first rehearsal for the play, and I heard her read the part, I immediately rewrote it to make it bigger because she was too talented for the part to be that small. Uh, and uh, uh, a lot of that material remained when we did the film. And as you will see or have seen, she's just uh, incredibly winning uh, as the older uh, mother. And how about the singing with the actors? Because of course, Emily and Jamie both sing beautifully and it looks completely convincing, I have to say. And it feels very authentic to me. It's not, it's beautiful, but it's not too perfect. Um, so how do they feel about that and how did you achieve that? Yeah, I didn't want to do a music video. I wanted, you know, I, I actually also am an incredible fan of amateurism. Uh, of amateur talent nights and of talent nights in general. I was raised with talent nights. We had them in my living room every Saturday night. My father played the accordion and sang Irish songs and my aunts got up and danced uh, with the children uh, in the living room. And uh, my uncles sang songs and everybody- Yeah, it's a very them. Irish thing. I remember doing a new, having a new year in Ireland and yeah, you know, yeah. on New Year's Eve and the kids stand up and everyone stands up and sings an old folk song or and yeah. I kind of thought, am I in a movie? This is actually real. It's, um, it's Yeah, well, you know, that's what we do. We shot it in a pub uh, and uh, made it, you know, that it was an amateur event, a little fundraiser for a school. Uh, and uh, Emily, of course, has got, you know, major chops as a singer, uh, you know, brought, it, brought it down into the realm of the human as opposed to the superhuman for our our circumstances and more about the emotional event that is going on because she's singing this song to a fellow who's it was his wife's favorite song Chris Walken and uh, I wanted it to be that as opposed to man can she belt uh, and uh, Jamie Dornan is a, is a quite an accomplished uh, singer and again though I wanted that homemade feeling and they were very much able to do that mm. um, it was and you know, I get I, there is no particular place, I suppose, where it's appropriate to bring in, but it must be brought in, that Jamie's married to Amelia Warner, who is her uh, is a composer uh, and singer, and uh, she did the score for this film, uh, and as you experienced, it is a fabulous score. She did yeah, a beautiful. wonderful yeah. job, wonderful. Uh, and she was, uh, we had a, a very special collaboration where we really seemed to both be able to get on the same page without excessive pain. Uh, and uh, then I noticed that one of her cues, I said, you know, that could be the beginning of a song. Uh, and I uh, sent her a recording of me singing just the first couple of lines of the song that fit with the music she'd written. And said, so what do you think of this? She said, oh, I love it, but you know, where's the rest of the song? And so I wrote the whole song and she uh, composed a, 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 from that little jumping off place of the beginning of her cue, she composed the whole song. Uh, and uh, I, we sent it to Sinead O'Connor and she recorded it and it's gorgeous. Uh, so uh, that part of the collaboration uh, the musical part with Jamie, How amazing. And Emily, and then Amelia. Uh, it all added up to something that must be in any film that takes place in Ireland, which is great music. Yeah, did you have the music in your mind when you were shooting, or did you ever have the? Did you have music on set ever? Are you playing music? I'm obviously when there's the Swan uh, Lake uh, element. 
there, there were musicians in the talent night scene. Uh, and uh, there, of course, you know, uh, J uh, Jamie and Emily did their uh, performances and singing that they do in the film. Other than that, no, but you know, there is music coming out of the earth of Ireland. Yeah, so uh, you do have you have music in mind when you're driving around, and I yes, guess you, you can't help but have that. I thought one thing the tone that you achieve, and it's partly a signature of yours, and but it's just interesting to know how you make those choices between the pathos and the comedy. It felt like it it ran very smoothly from one to the other in a very charming way. That as soon as it got a bit sad and then someone would undercut it with a joke and uh, but it never felt like jokes for jokes sake so I guess there's something you just work through in the script or does that ever change in the edit as well do you find yourself still steering that tonal line well you know the uh there's a there's a grief in my work that fuels the comedy uh and uh there's a very, there's a very present knowledge that we're all going to die and very soon. So you might as well get on with living. Uh, if you go back and you look at Moonstruck, they do nothing but talk about death through the entire film. It's their favorite subject. Uh, and uh, it's one of my favorite subjects because strangely enough, I find uh, the fact that I'm going to die and that everybody else is going to die very freeing uh, and uh, joyful because I'm like, oh man, so this is the party. We better get on with it, you know? Yeah. We better live because afterwards we're not gonna be living no more. Uh, and uh, that tone, that, I think that's where that tone comes from. And it's very timeless. Did you have um, conversations with yourself about like there's no cell phones, which is, there's, there's like one iPad, I think. Maybe cell phones, I didn't think there were. And it felt very timeless. And suddenly John Hamm has this iPad. It's like, whoa, technology. And it seems <laughs> perfect for kind of his his character. But um, was that a decision or just kind of the way it just... Oh, no, it's very, much a, very yeah. much a decision. You know, actually with Moonstruck, I did that as well. I, you know, I said to the director this story the way that I've designed it, it can take place with anywhere within a 40 year period uh, in terms, and you know, I hope that the costumes reflect that, that the music reflects that. I don't, and I wrote in all the music for Moonstruck. There's one cue in Moonstruck, which was not what I said. And it, it, it jars me every time because it sounds dated and everything else doesn't, you know, it's a very mm. small thing you wouldn't notice. It. And in this one, uh, I, basically came up with, okay, Americans have cell phones and iPads. Uh, and uh, the Irish people could, but they don't happen to have any reason to reach for one in the course of telling this story. I made it mm -hmm. my business that they didn't have any reason to reach for one. Uh, uh, and, and part of that is because there is nothing cinematic about cell phones. It's, Tell me about it, yeah. As a, as a filmmaker, I'm just, it drives me crazy. A, it's so easy to sort out a plot issue. Yes. And why don't you just call, just call them, call the police. But um, so I spend a lot of time <laughs> noticing when I am not using a cell phone yeah. or an iPad or anything else. And which turns to be, you know, quite a, quite a decent amount of time. Mm. I, it, and, felt, uh, it felt so and, right, but then it was great when the modern, the airplanes and then the, the contemporary postman turns up, but it all seemed to web together really well. It was great. And then the, the very, I was wondering, because the, 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 the dialogue's fantastic and very funny, and I find it very hard to describe whatever that Irish humour is, the kind of weird double negative twisty sentences that, um, like I've noted one down, I'm half dying for living for you, um, which mm -hmm. is an Emily Blunt line. And there was it was packed with that stuff. I was wondering, do you were you literally when you're in Ireland, do you have a note a notepad in your hand that you're thinking that's a good one, because yes. um, you seem to just the get that essence of that of actually, that ironic way of speaking. When I first when I first visited with my family, they I mean in the course of one week, they used so many folk sayings that I had never heard before that I took to going and sitting in the car for half an hour every day and just writing down what they said. Uh, ultimately, funnily enough, 
that almost none of those appear in the script, but they inform and enrich the way that the people speak. You know, I was fortunate enough to grow up with a father and several uncles that all had Irish brogues. So I was very attuned to that. And I had one edge with a Scottish burr, heavy, heavy Scottish burr. Uh, and then a whole bevy of aunts who had Greenpoint Brooklyn accents. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And all of that is just, to me, you know, food. It's sustenance. Yeah, no, and for the actors too, they must have loved having, because they threw yeah. them away quite nicely. They didn't. They just played them as though this is just the way we speak. They didn't make a big deal of it, which I thought was was great. That's true, and I noticed that. You know, I let the actors do whatever the hell they want, and then if something else is needed, then I'll I'll say a little something. Uh, and a lot of the time, nothing was needed. You know, I want what they're bringing. I don't want them to do what I want. I want them. I'm hiring their whole selves, and I want them to celebrate their whole selves. And they yeah. had a good time. They had a good time. And do you enjoy, if you had to choose, I guess it's an impossible question, but if, as someone who's write, written a lot and directed a lot, is there one discipline you prefer? Is there something great about having the control of directing your own work? Or sometimes is it quite nice just to let it go and see what someone else makes of it? I'm not, you know, I'm not that interested in control in general. I don't get off on control. I, uh, I do... Uh, enjoy having my visions realized in three dimensions. Uh, and by that, I don't mean like line readings or uh, I mean scenically. Uh, and so, you know, there's things in this, like there's a signature weeping hawthorn tree in the film. Mm. Uh, and uh, that was, you know, that tree is uh, 20 feet high or something. That was dug up with an excavator and moved onto that hill and planted after I drew in where I wanted that tree to be. And so to get to do stuff like that, that's just fun, you know? Uh, yeah. And, uh, and to, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of pre-production and of all of the production design elements. That's where I live. And on this case, sometimes uh, when I'm shooting, uh, I get bored. This one, I never got bored. I loved shooting the film because these people were so great uh, and the place was so great. Post-production is not my favorite thing. Uh, you know, I know some directors live for the editing room. I live to get out of the editing room. I'm not a, you know, a, a, a nitpicker. I'm sort of a more big picture guy. So I actually need significant support once we get to the editorial stage. Right, right. And so was, was it quite testing in Ireland? I mean, the weather can be, I was looking, it looks like you had a lot of rain in the script, which producers are often trying to get out because of the expense and hassle of doing it. But the, the, the weather seemed to be kind of a character, but I was looking and thinking, is that real rain there or is that rain machine? Because it felt like you had a bit of a mixture. It was a, it was a bit of a mixture. And I had the attitude that whatever happens, because I was in the West of Ireland where the weather is to put it kindly, changeable. Uh, and uh, I said, well, whatever happens on a given day, no matter what it says in the script, that's exactly what I meant. I'm never gonna fight the weather. I'm never gonna say it's a sunny day when it's not. I'm never gonna, you know, I'm gonna find a way. Uh, and uh, then uh, on the day that was supposed to be the biggest, most tumultuous rainstorm, it was the most beautiful day in the history of Ireland. Uh, and I said, this is perfect. This is what I intended all along. Uh, and we had, you know, rain machines, significant rain machines out. Yeah, the horizontal with... rain. It was fantastic. And big, yeah, big, yeah. Irish, big Irish drop drops. But the um, interesting thing about it was that it, it was a very particular thing that, I, that needed to be accomplished in the scene. And I had no idea how to accomplish it, which was they're supposed to be in this massive rainstorm. And he's supposed to look from the rainstorm to this hill and say, there's some sunlight over there. Let's go there. Uh, and I, I, I had no clue. I figured, well, I guess post-production, you know, we'll have to come up with something. 
Uh, and uh, when we shot it, it was a gorgeous sunny day, as I said. And we had this beautiful rushing river right behind where we were shooting them. And so we had the rain machines going and the rain pelting down and rainbows started to appear all around them. Uh, and behind them, this glistening rushing river and the green hills, and they turn around and the mountain that they're going to, the hill that they're going to, was lit up with this gorgeous sunlight and beautiful fluffy white clouds and blue sky. And I'm like, this is actually, I think I got the whole thing here without yeah, it's perfect. ever doing it. And it worked out. Yeah, and when he says, oh, there's sunny up there, you buy it because you can see a bit of sunlight in the background and the, the swollen river just adds to the believability of the rain. Completely. Yeah, yeah. That green was something that really, from the, from the opening shot, that green was so lush. Was that something you, I mean, obviously when you go to Ireland, it is the Emerald Isle, but did you push that in the grey? Was that something that you were like, because there's the green and the red that's contrasting a lot of the time, yeah. very limited, no, and very it, beautiful, but. That, this, this, that's the Connor farm. And the minute I saw the photographs of the farm, I like called up the location scout and I said, does it really look like that? <laughs> and uh, he's, he said, well, you'll see for yourself. And uh, we went and I'm like, yeah, we got to get this place. <laughs> it was the greenest green I have ever seen anywhere. It was endlessly gorgeous. And I'll tell you a funny thing. There was a you know, boundary fence. It was a big farm. And then at one point, you know, I'm walking along, you come to a boundary fence. On the other side of the boundary fence, it got drab. <laughs> it was that farm was just pure magic mm. yeah it came across on screen definitely okay thanks john this is peter catania signing off it's been great to have a chat with john patrick shanley about his wonderful new film wild mountain time thank you john thank you peter it was great talking with you